Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we just thank you so much for another opportunity to come into your presence by means of the Holy Spirit, by grace, to approach the throne of grace boldly. We ask that you would guide us, take charge of this time, this, this hour, and just filter out all that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. Teach us to rest in you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're studying together 2 Corinthians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were uh, just about to finish the 10th chapter, verses 17 and 18 of chapter 10, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the administration of the grace of God as it apl uh, applies practically to, to all believers. And now we're looking in the 10th chapter at the authority that's vested in the Word of God. And I've suggested to you that since the New Testament was not complete at this particular time, Paul, the Apostle Paul, as God's appointed apostle, is typical of the authority of the Word of God. We know that when we get to Colossians, that the Holy Spirit uh, had had appointed Paul to complete the Word of God so that Paul was speaking as God. You know, we're not here to make uh, great claims for Paul or to boast about uh, some outstanding individual, but simply to point out that, that God used him as God uses the Word. There's always the question of authority. You know, and and don't I have the same authority, says somebody, you know, the same right to choose any authority that I please. And, and of course you do. That's true of every one of us. That's, that is surely a liberty that God's granted us. And I have trusted in this fellowship, at least, that you have not been directed to look at the authority of anything but the Scriptures. That's what Paul's saying. And folks, I hope and I pray that I function in the light of that same spirit, of the light of the Word of God. You know, and to not do so is wrong. Our canon, our source of authority is this book. And that's basically the argument of the 10th chapter. When we reach the 17th verse, the word glory, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. We could, we could translate this probably more properly he that boasts, let him boast in the Lord. You know, it, it would seem like every authority is appealing to your conscience, to your mind, to your intelligence for, you know, for an audience. And to that degree, then, there is boasting. You know, we go to, we go to a seminar uh, on a, a particular subject, and primarily we go maybe because we're interested in the subject, you know, whether it's like a prophecy seminar or whether it's some other type of seminar. But we immediately, we look at who's in charge. Who's, who are the participants? Well, Dr. So-and-so and so-and-so and doctor. You know, they're, they're going to be there. And, you know, so that'd be worth going to. Now, that's the idea of the boast. And there's a thing called idle boasting. That's when you might claim as something that you're not or you cannot do. That's, that's an idle boast. The Greek uses the word for boast of, of these authorities who profess to speak for Christ but are laying out their own claims. Okay, now in the, in the, in the 12th verse, we were told that we wouldn't dare, we wouldn't, we wouldn't take the chance of classing ourselves with those who commend themselves because they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves among themselves and in doing this, well, the text says they're foolish. So when we get to the 17th verse, he that boasts, you know, he that lays this claim, let it, let it be in the Lord. The claim is in the Lord, and that's where it ought to be. You know, 
because it's not he that commendeth himself that's approved, but whom the Lord commends. And that word there, you know, tsunami, it, we could properly translate this uh, for not he that stands with himself, but he that the Lord stands with. I think that's what the text is saying. And that's what counts. And that is, in fact, I think the proper translation. Uh, the first place that that word occurs in the New Testament is in the ninth chapter of Luke on the Mount of Transfiguration when it uh, speaks of Peter and those who stood with him. That's the way they translated. For, for it, it is not he that stands with himself, but it's the one whom the Lord stands with. That's what counts. Many of you followed us through Romans. It was back in Romans that we were told that, you know, who is he that judges? Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather has risen again. You know, if you lay a charge against your brother, you must lay that charge against Christ. And same goes for yourself. You know, because Christ declared you righteous. And I say that as tactfully as I can. The uh, Roman Catholic Information Society, and they, well, they put out a pamphlet. I'm not going to talk about the author, but the subject of this tract, this pamphlet, is the preaching of sovereign grace. And, and I, I want to quote from this. The idea of salvation by grace is so simple that it makes one suspicious at the very start. It's too simple to be true. I continue to quote, It just cannot be done. If we are to take these preachers seriously, we must believe that simple trust does everything. This trust is like a rocking chair that's going to swing us right through the pearly gates. There is little chance of salvation apart from the Roman priest and the masses offered for sin. One is helpless without the confessional, the special aid of the Virgin, the saying of Hail Marys, the counting veneration of saints and images, candles, scapulars, various trinkets to ward off special evils, extreme unction, masses after death to get out of purgatory, and simpler, uh, similar procedures by the Roman Catholic Church. My text, he's, the, it goes on to say, is Philippians 2.12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Who would want to take his chances on getting out of purgatory without the help of a priest? End quote. Now, I'm not picking on anybody or any organization. I would ask you in your own intelligence to compare how you read the Word of God with that. You know, someone is making a claim of authority here. That's, that's, that's the Word in the Greek. Is it in Christ? No, it's not in Christ. It's in humans. It's in tradition. It's in procedures. It's in services. But it is not in Christ. And I recognize that peer pressure can be very great and that there are multiplied millions who would agree with the thesis of that pamphlet that I read. But folks, my text says, not he that stands with himself. And the sense there is standing with a group where we measure ourselves among ourselves and compare ourselves with ourselves, but it's the one the Lord stands with. That's what counts. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who lays claim to bearing the burden of mine and, and your sin. You see the terrible devastation on the other side is that if sovereign grace is not the way to eternal life, then human works is, and we've reduced the righteousness of God to an attainable goal, and that is absolutely not true. It is absolutely anti-scriptural. I believe it's because of claims like this, legalism and, and human works and human merit, that the Holy Spirit goes on. Oh, I would that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, and indeed you are bearing with me. 
You are enduring me, for I am jealous over you with God's jealousy. Your authorized version says godly jealousy. Some of the modern translations speak of divine jealousy. I believe the text says, I am jealous over you with God's jealousy so that I can properly refer to the Old Testament scriptures and see God's claim to being a jealous God. The context of his being a jealous God is that his people Israel are not to be involved with other gods, but only with him. I am jealous over you with God's jealousy. And the subject goes on exactly as it does in the Old Testament. For I am jealous as to you with the jealousy of God. For I've, I have betrothed you to one husband to present a pure virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. The picture here is of Paul as the father giving away the bride. And he has great pride in the bride that she is pure, that she is dedicated to one husband and no other that there is to be no other relationship in that relationship. That's, that's spiritual adultery. That was God's jealousy over Israel. I believe that physical adultery is anti-Scripture. But I believe the predominant theme is a spiritual fornication and spiritual adultery that God was greatly concerned over Israel becoming involved with the false worship of cults of the merit systems that would somehow insidiously convince me that there is a way that I can gain merit with God. That in one way or another, he's very much like a human. And that I can touch his emotional side by my efforts. God, on the other hand, was a jealous God who said, I am your God. I ain't called you out of Egypt. I did that. You didn't ask me to be called out of Egypt. I did that. I preserved you in the wilderness. I led you through the Red Sea. I provided your needs. You didn't ask for it. There is not a shred of evidence in the Old Testament that any Israelite asked for new clothes or shoes. But we do see that the, that the old ones never wore out. Now, he may have wanted an ATV or a fast horse or a new Dodge Ram pickup, but, but in all honesty, as he looked back, God had adequately supplied his every need in an impossible situation, and he never asked for it. What was Israel to do? Simply follow God. Was it based on merit? Absolutely not. The justified man lives by faith, is the theme of the Old Testament Scriptures. They were told to, they were to trust God. They were to believe God. The argument here of the second verse is a beautiful picture for spiritual purity, for doctrinal purity. An argument for the Word of God itself. I don't want you Corinthians presented to Christ involved in all kinds of other illicit spiritual activities. I want a pure doctrinal relationship between you and the Lord. Because I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. This is the only place in the epistles where the serpent is mentioned. Satan, of course, is mentioned, and, 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 and some of the commentaries would suggest that what the Apostle Paul is trying to do here is point out what a, what a slimy picture this is of spiritual deceit. Yet the text would tell me in the Old Testament that the serpent at that time was the most beautiful of all creatures. God did curse the serpent, and a portion of that curse is that he'd slither on the ground. So it is pure foolishness to suggest that he slithered on the ground when he came to Eve. 
The Scriptures declare He was beautiful beyond description. Well, it, He actually is described, but the description is beyond description. I, I don't know what He looked like, but boy, there must have been a change when God got through with Him. So He was very attractive, and He beguiled Eve. He deceived her. That's the word. The serpent deceived Eve. Adam was not deceived, folks. Just as Christ was not deceived. You know, we read that in Timothy. Adam, Adam was not deceived. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. Eve did not know what she was doing. Eve represents the church, the bride of Christ. Original Adam, second Adam. Eve was deceived. The church is deceived. Now we know why God determined Eve be deceived, not Adam. Okay? The next word bothers me. I fear lest by any means as a serpent deceived Eve by means of craftiness. Craftiness. The word craftiness there. I have every right to translate this literally. I fear lest by any means as the serpent deceived Eve in his ability to do anything he wants to do, so your mind should be corrupted from the single-mindedness that is in Christ. I think the word craftiness is an interesting translation. The authorized version has subtlety. None of those words express the power of our enemy. The word would indicate to me that he has the deceiving ability to do anything that he wants to do. It is not human merit that would guard me from that craftiness or that ability. It is not human dedication. It is not human resolve. It must be the sovereignty of my God. That was the great concern here. Anything that would remove us from the single-mindedness that is in Christ. You are absolutely besieged with the merit system. You know, the prospect of legalism was as much an enemy then as it is now, and, and vice versa. It is not a battle that has been won, folks. It is not a conflict that's resolved, that's, that's finished. But it is by far and away your single greatest conflict. Most Christians, I don't think, even realize what their greatest conflict is. And someone says, sovereign grace makes it too simple. Steve, you saying we shouldn't work for it. You know, and you see, well, you know, well, that, that, that all sounds good until you stop for just a minute and you, to think, think that through. Because what we're saying is that, that the righteousness of God is attain, attainable by human er effort. Folks, there is no righteousness on the human level. I mean, true righteousness on the human level that we're not we don't have that capability of producing that man is totally depraved we're told that man cannot enter the kingdom of god therefore it must be through christ all righteousness is of the lord we are told that a man cannot receive the words of god it must be through christ there is no human merit that would overcome man's total depravity none whatsoever Throw out total depravity, you got to throw out grace. Folks, why is it such a shocking thing that we should be faced with the prospect that God's righteousness is so much higher than ours? That He had to do it for us? Why would that offend us? And Paul's great concern, the, the Holy Spirit's concern, dearly beloved, the Holy Spirit's concern is that the believers at Corinth would be directed away from the finished work of Jesus Christ. What is important is that Jesus Christ stands with me, with us. That I can believe by faith that my life is hid with Christ in God. Most of you most, if not all of you, recognize that scripturally speaking, what I, what I read you from that, you know, anything like what I just read you from that Catholic nonsense, it, it can be dynamically supported by scripture. I mean, if, if you twist those scriptures, 
you know, Philippians 2, you know, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, it's amazing he wouldn't finish the sentence. You know, I'll, I'll, although I, I've, I find that many of the cults and many of the arguments against Scripture never finish the sentence. What is the next verse? For it is God who worketh within you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Isn't it obvious, even in Philippians, that what the Holy Spirit is appealing for is, is responsibility in a new life, not any effort to gain that new life. That's, that's the prospect of sovereign grace. Am I urged and, and encouraged to trust God? Of course. With what? My new life. The new life, which God by sovereign grace has given me. And in one way or another, the logic of man will, will, will chip slowly, slowly against that stone, that, that rock of the finished work of Jesus Christ. You, you must believe and be baptized. They go down the list. I mean, you just, you know, you got you to surrender, you got to believe, you got to give up cigarettes, cards, monopoly, or, you know, or, or God knows what. You know, back when I was a kid, it was a hula hoop. You know, in one way or another, that persecution, that insidious persecution begins. Now we brothers, says the scriptures, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Now you got to stop and think, folks. When was Isaac promised? Long before he was born. Not after Abraham knew that Sarah was you know, expecting to, to have a child. But long before Abraham ever knew that Sarah could expect a child, Isaac was promised. Now God says that you were promised and to him the same way. Now I'm telling you, I'm, I'm suggesting to you that the Word of God says without any argument, amazing as it may seem, astounding as it may seem, that your eternal life was promised to you before you were born and is absolutely certain because of that promise. There is no way anyone could suggest that Isaac would not be born because God promised it. It must come to pass. Is he not saying the same thing as he does in Galatians, that you were promised before you were ever born? But oh, the, you know, the scriptures go on and, and but as then, even so it is now. He that is born after the flesh, that is, that is human works, persecutes him that was born after the Spirit. So it is now that he who is born by human works persecutes him who was born by promise. And that's the great argument. That was the problem in Corinth. It's the problem in your community today in your town, in your city. Doesn't matter where you live on this planet. The great voices that are raised against Christianity are human merit and they're insidious voices. They're the voices of deceit. They're the voices of craftiness. Because when the cult is filled with great amounts of air, you know, it's easy to detect the error, but human merit and human works sound so good. So good. On the surface. Somebody, you know, approached me, you know, many years ago and they said, Steve, you you gotta admit, you gotta just you must admit that God is more impressed by the man who tries to keep the law, even though he doesn't, than than he is by the man who doesn't even try. Not, I doubt that that works with God because it surely doesn't work with the highway patrol. I mean, well, officer, I was, I'm, you know, I was, I was trying to do 55. You know, and he gets that funny look on his face like he's heard that before. Now, now I recognize I have no right to, to liken the highway patrol to God, but neither do I have any right to put something into the Word of God that's not there. 
Will you show me, will you show me one passage of scripture that indicates that God is more impressed by the man who tries and doesn't make it than he is by the man who doesn't even try at all? Oh, oh sure, Steve. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I'll go. There's the, there's the kid who said, yeah, I'll go and didn't. And then there's the kid who said he, he wouldn't go and he did, which, which, which one did the will of his father? Obviously, the one that did it, even though he said he wasn't going to do it, but both of them were the father's kid. I don't know how we miss those things in the Word of God. They weren't becoming the father's child by doing the father's will. We are talking about sonship there. God was talking about obedience. As a new creation in Christ, as one who possesses eternal life, God encourages me, exhorts me to obey. Him. But you know the thesis that, that is always presented to me, to, to me is, you know, uh, we'll, we're going to take those those scriptures of fellowship and obedience, and we're going to make them them the dynamic of eternal life. And, and if we don't obey, if we don't do the will of the Father or, or whatever or something else, we'll be cast away and we'll, we'll go to hell. I believe the argument here is one, folks, for the finished work of Christ. In fact, the argument is, is one for the sovereign grace of God. Jesus did pay it all. We read in Colossians that we are complete in Him. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that, folks? If you're complete in Christ, what is there left to do but trust Him? Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, thanks for watching.